there have been an untold number of medical advancements since December 14th, 1799. That is the date that President George Washington, uh, many describe him as the father of our nation. It's the day that he passed away. Uh, the day before, Washington had complained about a cough, runny nose, and then there was a distinct hoarseness in his voice. Doctors were called to Mount Vernon, and in an effort to treat his illness, doctors turned to the practice of bloodletting. That's when doctors literally drained blood in an effort to heal the patient. By the time Washington passed away, it is estimated that the president had lost 40% of his blood volume. Now, doctors no longer recommend bloodletting, uh, but I think many of us would look back at uh, Washington's stories and even those of us with very little medical experience that we might suggest that practice did more harm than good. Wrong concepts, wrong practices, they can have devastating effects. Whether we have an example like we've just discussed physically, or like we're going to see in our lesson tonight when we think in spiritual matters. Wrong concepts and wrong practices can have devastating effects. In Jesus' day, religious leaders had the wrong idea about the Messiah. They questioned Jesus at every turn. They accused him of blasphemy. And in the end, they had him arrested and crucified on a cross. Those who should have recognized Jesus easier than all the others rejected the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God. I want to take us to Matthew chapter 22 as we begin our study tonight. It's a conversation that will actually take us to our passage that will be the centerpiece of our lesson. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 41, Jesus is having a conversation, a very important conversation with the Pharisees. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Challenging conversation from Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 through 45. The Pharisees had wrong concepts when it came to the Messiah. They were correct in their thinking that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. They were incorrect. They were wrong when it came to the idea that the Messiah would be setting up a physical kingdom. Basically, where they would be reliving the, the glory days of King David and King Solomon. That's where they really missed, was this connection that the Messiah wasn't about as, like this physical kingdom that the Pharisees pictured, but he was about a spiritual kingdom. Um, how can I describe that? Well, it, in, in the book of Matthew, when Jesus has the disciples together, and he says, uh, what are all the other people saying about me? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they went around giving some answers. But then Jesus asked the second question. It was really the, the heart of the conversation. He said, what about you? Who do you say that the Son of Man is? Peter immediately answered, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Based on that statement, read the rest of the story. Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon that rock, I will build my church. On the rock, what rock? The rock that Jesus is the Messiah. 
Jesus would be the chief cornerstone of the church. That Jesus would be that everything came about by Him. Jesus would be the head of the church and we would be the body. Jesus is the Messiah. And He came to bring about a spiritual kingdom. In this conversation of Matthew chapter 22, Jesus made reference to Psalm 110. And that is the focus of our study tonight. As we turn there, uh, don't forget Jesus' question, because it is a good one. What do you think about the Messiah? For us, we might just as well ask too, what, what do you think about Jesus? It's the most important question. Hear this. It is the most important question that any of us will ever answer in our lives. What do you think of Jesus? What we do with that question has eternal consequences. Before we go to Psalm 110, I'd like to follow along in the New Testament. Just a moment, okay? Uh, we could stay with the Pharisees because the Pharisees continued to reject Jesus as the Messiah. Their wrong judgment consumed them. They were filled with anger. They put together a plot. They had Jesus arrested, crucified on a cross. Jesus' body was taken out, was buried in a borrowed tomb. However, on that Sunday morning, God raised His Son from the dead. The tomb was found empty. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. He is our Messiah and our King. Jesus appeared among His disciples over a period of 40 days, and it wasn't long after that till the day of Pentecost came. And it was on the day of Pentecost that Peter stood up, preached this bold sermon to just, uh, some believe the estimate of crowd, to be over 100,000 people. A large crowd. Part of His sermon, we read in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 29. Peter said, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Well, there it is again. Matthew chapter 22, Acts chapter 2. Both quote from Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. As we will see, this is one of the most quoted Old Testament verses in the New Testament, and it's just one of the most quoted, period, that we're going to find. When New Testament writers and New Testament teachers were turning to the Old Testament, this was a most popular verse. So Psalm 110 is important. It has always been important. I may just be now getting around to preaching on this important psalm, and for that I apologize. But you know, even old guys like me continue to learn about the importance of God's Word. I guess that's the beauty, isn't it? Of reading through Scripture year after year. Of being reminded of these new, uh, to me, passages. Now, I've read it before. I've read it before. I've read it in, in Matthew. I've read it in, in Acts. I've read it in Hebrews. Other 
uh, New Testament accounts. But this is the time that I went back to the source. That's what I want to share with us tonight as we go back to Psalm 110. Now, it's only seven verses long. There's a lot said in seven verses. We really look at the Messiah in three different pictures. In the picture of a king, a priest, and a judge. So with that, let's get started, shall we? Chapter 110, verse 1, in the book of Psalms. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. All right, I need to go back to verse 1 for a second. The verse 1, remember, we read it in Matthew 22 and in Acts chapter 2. This is the psalm from which it came. Notice the Hebrew language. Beautiful here. And if, if we weren't careful, we would almost miss this. In Psalm 110, the Lord, now it's translated into English in all capital letters. That tells us something, doesn't it? All right. Then we have, the Lord says to my Lord, that's all little lowercase letters. That tells us something as well. Let's find out, okay? So we fast forward here to a little Hebrew language. Uh, Lord, with all capital letters, is the word Yahweh, which is the name of God. So the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, Adonai. It's different. It's different terminology. It's two different words there. Here's the beauty of this. The Messiah is not merely David's son, one of David's descendants, but also he is David's Lord. This is a powerful statement, especially when you go back to Matthew chapter 22, and Jesus quoted that. Uh, what would the Pharisees do? They could not resolve the paradox of this passage without admitting that, well, the Messiah is not... It's not just about human, it's not just about physical kingdom. Because the spiritual language in verse 1 is just too strong. It can't be denied. You can't explain it away. So what we're talking about is although Jesus came as one of David's descendants, what we recognize is that David called Jesus Lord. Jesus is not only David's descendant, but he is also the only begotten Son of God. I want us to think about the implications of Psalm 110. What will we do with Jesus? That was really the question that started the whole conversation in Matthew 22. What will we do with the Christ? What will we do with the Messiah? Now, a lot of people try to do a lot of different things with it. They want to say that Jesus was a good moral man. He was a caring and compassionate man. He was a great leader, a, a great teacher. Here's the thing, and I think C.S. Lewis puts this as well as anybody I've ever read. That for all of the things that people try to do with Jesus, there's really only, well, there's only a couple of choices and only one right one. For all the things that Jesus said and the claims that he made about himself, you, you can't ignore those. You can't ignore the fact that he quoted Psalm 110 and what he's doing there is he's identifying David as the author, he's identifying this as a messianic prophecy, and he's saying something about himself. You can't deny that. You can't just write that away. Jesus with the man that came down from the roof and his friends let him down. Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. You can't just write that away. So we look at that and say, man, either Jesus was lying about the whole thing, he was a lunatic, or the only other option we have. He either didn't tell the truth 
He was out of his mind. Our Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He is Messiah and King. We don't have another choice. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, our Messiah and King. Now, back to Psalm 110, verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1, we see that Jesus talks about this right hand. And if you remember from our study of Hebrews, we talked about the right hand is a, a seated at the right hand of the throne, that that was a statement of completion. It was also a statement of authority, a place of, uh, of authority. We also then see in verse 2 where it talks about the Messiah's rule. And then in verse 3, where it talks about His power and His authority, the Messiah is King. That's the message of Psalm 110, verses 1 through 3. Then we come to verse 4, which is a powerful statement because it says that this King is also our priest. He is our great high priest. All right, let's get to that. Verse 4, it talks about Jesus being, um, sorry, let me go back to this. He talks about um, that he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I'm so thankful for our study in the book of Hebrews. Because when we go back to, to that and, and we think about all of the time we spent talking about Melchizedek, Melchizedek is really only mentioned three times in the Bible. Total of about 18 verses. You have Genesis chapter 14, Psalm 110, and then Hebrews chapters 5, 6, and 7. So uh, Genesis 14 is where it begins. So let's look at that. Where Scripture tells us, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. I should have told you this first, that Abraham had just won an important victory. And Abraham met Melchizedek along the way. Melchizedek already described as king of Salem and priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Wow. Wow. Interesting thought because Melchizedek, the whole mentioning of him in, in Genesis, and then when we look at the, the references back, and the Hebrew writer provides some good explanation for this. From where did Melchizedek come? Who was king or priest before him? We don't know because there was no genealogy. Who was the king and priest that followed him? We don't know because there's no genealogy. Melchizedek stands out alone as this great message in Scripture. And I think really just to point us to Jesus. Because Jesus would be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Important statement there. Now, we have to understand that without this uh, study of Melchizedek, this is why this is so important. Without this study of Melchizedek, we would have a great hurdle to overcome in our study of the New Testament. It's critical. A major claim about the saving work of Jesus on the cross would face scrutiny because Jesus is described as the great, High priest who offered himself as this perfect sacrifice. And if Jesus is not a priest, then that's not a role he's supposed to perform. But Jesus was a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus was a, a priestly king, a kingly priest. Jesus was ruler, king, but he's also, he's also our priest. He is the perfect high priest who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. 
Then we come, we've seen the Messiah as the king, as a priest, and now finally as the judge. We go to Psalm 110, verses 5 through 7, where Scripture says, The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of His wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and uh, crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so He will lift His head high. Wow! That um, kind of changes the tone, doesn't it? Because when we've talked about the, the king and his, his rule, people being subject to him, we've talked about the priestly role and the offering of the sacrifice, but now you, you have this picture of, of him being the judge, but he steps into this battlefield. Uh, it's just a powerful, powerful scene. Enemies will be crushed. The Messiah's in battle. Enemies are going to be crushed. And the Messiah will judge the nations. Verse 7 is really interesting. Uh, he will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Uh, there are some scholars that believe that this is a poetic statement, a poetic fashion, uh, making the point that the Messiah will carry out his judgment swiftly and that none will escape. I, I take that and I present that to you and I recognize that there are people that know more about this passage and about the idea of Hebrew poetry than I do. So I share that with you just to give you this idea. But I'll tell you this, what I just shared with you does not contradict Scripture. In fact, what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, he says, Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Wow. It will happen quick, won't it? It will happen very quickly. In the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, and in that moment, that for which some of us have lived our entire lives, that we have waited to hear the words, well done. And it will be a great moment of victory where the, the perishable will be made imperishable, where the mortal will be clothed with immortality. It will be a great moment when we step into heaven for the first time and for all time. Now for others, that instant will be the most horrifying moment by far than anything that they've ever experienced. To hear the words depart from me and to realize the finality of that statement it will be overwhelming. I, I, I can't even find the words to describe that. For all eternity, you will be banished from the Lord. You will be banished from those that you love. You will never see them again. You will live in pain, in sorrow, in hurt, in agony for all eternity. So what's the difference between the two? Well, see, we have that information. And it boils down to this. What do you do with Jesus? What do you do with Jesus? What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Because if Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, then that is the great confession that we make. And we can make that, repent of our sin, and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, going down in the water as we die to sin, being buried with Christ, and coming up again, raised to walk in newness of life. What will you do with Jesus? What do you think about the Messiah? I told you it's the most important question any of us will ever have to answer.